so then, yes, yeah, so the next thing we're going to talk about is, is soils. So here's a little cross section of soil, and soil is, is key. What, what the heck is soil? How would you guys define soil? Life? <laughs> Sound like you've been hanging out with my friends from Oregon. <laughs> Decaying matter, okay. Layers, okay, there's an aspect of layers in there. Mm -hmm. Nutrients, things for, for uh, plants to grow and, and uh, organisms to grow. So we'll define soil as unconsolidated natural material. That material is not just, uh, you know, um, a structural material, but it's material that supports or is capable of supporting vegetation. Our friends from Oregon State that really love soil sometimes describe soil as uh, an independent body. But even if you, if you don't ascribe to that uh, theory or approach, um, clearly soil has specific properties and or characteristics which um, differentiate itself. So soil has structure, we could say. And there's different parts of the soil. Or if you will, different soil types. And we're going to next talk about some of those types, some of those um, ways of characterizing soil. Going to run through a couple different things. So firstly, where does that soil come from? Ultimately, that's right, it ultimately comes from stuff that breaks down more contiguous material into smaller pieces. So weather in the form of hot, in the form of freezing ice, in the form of water and erosion, all those different things act to break down the parent material, whatever that is. Uh, it, bedrock is one of the main things, although soil can come from other materials as well. But bedrock is a, is a classic example, yes. So the climate. Then we have the thing that Jamie was just mentioning, which is what is the stuff that that climate is acting upon? And the parent material for soil is the primary material from which we generate our soil. Most classically, that would be something like bedrock, say a, a large hunk of granite that is starting to break down. But it could also be organic material, so things that were once living that have now died. Um, it could be uh, a former soil surface. We could generate new soil from the, the relics of a, of a previous soil uh, type or previous soil uh, area. And we can uh, pick up deposits from you know, dust blown in the air from, from volcanoes or things like that. The time over which soil forms is usually over the scale of hundreds to thousands of years. Not with every single process, but on average, it's, we're talking long time scales to take a parental material and turn it into soil. As we go through time, we go from relatively poorly developed soils, thin soils, if you will, soils that, yes, can support life, but not super well, to more expansive soils that are better able to support uh, plant life. Topography plays a large role in the formation of soil. Um, First and foremost, topography in this context is the location upon which landscapes uh, can affect how the climate interacts with the parent material. So, for example, we could talk about uh, the, the position on a um, discontinuity. So we could talk about the, the position, the, the height of soil, say, at the top of a rise relative to the bottom of the rise. And so, so that's going to influence what happens, the weathering rate, all that kind of stuff. Similarly, not, you could, you, we could spend all day doing this, but one would be high-low, another would be the aspect, say, of the side of a hill. If it's facing the sun, it's going to get more direct sunlight, it's going to be hotter, it's going to be drier than 
uh, of a slope facing another uh, direction. All this stuff, mineral accumulation, the nutrients that would subsequently support plant life, um, the types of plants that will be able to be supported here, how, how fast and how healthy those plants, uh, how fast those plants grow and how healthy those plants will be, erosion, all that stuff is strongly influenced by topography. The last key part about the formation of soil simply has to do with life, has to do with organisms themselves. So the invertebrates, say, say a worm that's living in the soil, the plants that are living in the soil, say the plant that has these very fine roots, they're going to send this roots in, root into this, uh, to this rock and help, help crack the rock and break the rock, uh, uh, microbial activity, fungal activity, all that stuff. Very important, indeed now the most important factor in soil formation now in our planet is human activity. We are not separate from the rest of the planet. We, we actually exert a greater influence in the rest of the planet. So if we talk about soil formation and do not talk about human activity, the way we pave over areas and make some of them impervious, uh, the way we, we excavate hillsides to put a road through, whatever it is, human activities are incredibly important in terms of the formation of soil. Biological activity um, affects, uh, yeah, I already said that, yeah. So basically biological activity affects waste production and decomposition and how the materials move through the soil profile. More about soil profiles in a second. And then uh, lastly, not only are, are living organisms having an effect on the soil formation, but a key part of these systems, especially when it comes to wetlands, is the, the life after death of these biological tissues. So how those tissues are worked over by micro the microbial community and then uh, in turn become the enrichment elements for soil. Organics, nitrogen, things of that nature. If we talk about the keep, okay, okay, so, so that's sort of the background stuff. Now, now that we're getting into things that you should know about to understand the quality of the soil in the context of wetland. So here's a couple things here. Um, we're gonna talk about grain size, also known as soil texture, meaning how big is the particle size of the soil element. We're gonna talk about organic matter, positioning or, or layering or horizons, different ways of saying the same thing, soil color. And then what I'm just referring to in the context of our class, since this, is, this isn't a, this is more of a theory class, but uh, chemistry. And in the context of our class, that would be sensor derived vital signs. So, so taking the pulse of the soil through probes, basically. Okay, this is where we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to being able to talk about, walk into a site and being able to talk about, for example, the gross type of soil that we have. And so what I'm showing you here on the right are some soil cores that I took from one of my old restoration sites. And it just so happens, this particular site, there's a lot of what we would call organic soils on the top. And so these are, these are clear tubes, what you're seeing. And so the top of the screen corresponds to the surface of the, of the soil. And then I have jammed essentially a straw down into the ground and, and pulled up a clear tube of, of sediment. Then if you look in, towards the bottom of that uh, tube, you'll see what looks whiter, more granitic, more, more rocky type stuff. That would be more what we'd call mineral soils. Uh, now, this is, this is uh, just an example. We're gonna, this will make more sense after a few minutes. But for example, mineral soils tend to be relatively depauperate in organics. This would be, say, for a, a more typical terrestrial site. Mineral soils tend to not be able to hold water too well, tend to be like rocks. Tend to be pH neutral, neither acidic uh, nor alkaline. Nutrients, are, if they're there, are readily available. They're not bound. So if it rains, we can suddenly get a huge pulse of nutrients get washed out of that, and then there's not a whole lot left.
Uh, part, sorry for that. Uh, and then, um, and then organic soils are are different. Organic soils tend to be uh, less, or it tend to be greater amounts of percent organics in there. They tend to be able to retain a lot of water, hold a lot of water. Tend to be acidic. And the nutrients are tightly bound. And so at first that sounds maybe that's a bad thing. Tightly bound, that sucks. But what it means is we don't get flushes of nutrients and it tends to be a more consistent uh, release or availability of nutrients, which generally is usually considered to be a better thing. All right, let's talk about soil grain size distribution. This is, we're, we're talking, so I have some soil in my hand here and this is very sandy. And so from this far away picture, you can see it looks like lots of little blips of color, right? Lots of little consistent blurbs. So this, this is a large grained uh, soil I have in my hand. And if you couldn't tell, that's ice plant underneath or, or in the background, the blurry background. And so then we're at the beach, right? So this is, this is very coarse. This is sand. This is beach sand basically in my hand. There is nothing magical about sand or silt or clay. It is completely arbitrary. It is simply, a, they're simply phrases that we've grown up with because we had to have something and let's go ahead and use that. And so these are, these are breaking points that are made by convention. There's nothing particularly magical about them. But having said that, here's our, here's our criteria. So sand is an average grain size, or, or something is considered sand if the grain size, the width of the ro mini rock, if you will, when we look at this soil in our hand, the width is greater than five hundredths of a millimeter. Silt is smaller than that um, to five one thousandths of a millimeter. And then clay is uh, smaller than that. So sand, silt, and clay. Sand, coarse stuff. Clay, very, very, very fine. Silt in between. Have you guys encountered this soil triangle in any of the other classes? What, what classes did you guys see? In ge oh, geology. Okay, you would have seen in geology. Any other classes? Which, oh, 200? Yeah. Okay, good. Interesting. Who's teaching your 200? You guys? Ah, I see. Okay, right. Cool. All right. <laughs> So anyway, so here we go. So th this is the famous soil triangle, and this is essentially a three-sided graph. So we've put our, our three categories, and, it, and essentially anything bigger, you know, significantly bigger than sand, we would just call rock or pebble or cobble or something like that. So we're talking about these three terms refer to the types of materials that plants could be growing in, right? And their roots intimately associated with the soil. So we have sand, silt, and clay, and it's just simply from 0 to 100 on, on each one. And again, this is an arbitrary breakdown. But if we go through this, you can, you can come up with a term for soil with a given texture. Turns out there's 12 different classes that uh, people traditionally, soil scientists traditionally view. You do not need to write all these down. Um, but I just list them to illustrate uh, there's a range of these things, right? And what I want to point out to you, we start with the sands and the sandy loams. Uh, this stuff, if we pick up in our hand and rub together, it does not make, it, it, just, it just is dirt that falls apart. Yeah, sorry. You can tell I'm not a soil scientist. Soil scientists don't like me to use the word dirt, but, but uh, s soil, sorry. If we took that soil and rubbed it in our hand, try to make a sausage of the soil, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it would just fall apart. It would, it would not be able to, the particles would not be able to grab to one another. As we go through here, as we go through my list down to the bottom here and then onto this next slide, we get into the more fine grain stuff, the more clay rich stuff. As we start to get into these areas, when we do that, when we rub the soil between our hands, it makes a little tube, it makes a little sausage, it makes a little Play-Doh tube of, of soil. And the more readily it makes that, and the more long we can make it without it breaking, that indicates there's more and more clay, right? We could pick up a piece of clay and rub it between our hands and it would, and we can make a big long snake of clay, right? Indeed, mm -hmm. and and that's what sometimes we do in preschool. We're making our first, you know, clay baskets, right? We just take it, rub, 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 make a coil, and then that's our, that's our dragon or our snake or our worm or whatever the heck we're making. 
Okay. Uh, so yeah. So basically, for wetlands, we're we're mostly talking about stuff that is towards the finer grain uh, spectrum of this. And so my friend Shelly there at one of our restorations is taking a soil core and she pulled the soil out and there's so much fine grain soil particles in there that it's stuck together, right? So she's just holding it in her hand, but it's still acting as if it's, uh, you know, glued together or what have you. Related to soil texture is this notion of permeability. Permeability is a measure of how easy it is for gas or liquid to go through uh, a given chunk of soil. If it can go through really easily, we say it's, it's highly permeable. If it cannot go through easily, we say that it has low permeability. This permeability is first and foremost a product of the soil texture a function of the grain size of the particles that are in there and how tightly those particles can be packed next to one another to essentially create blockages so that that gas or that liquid cannot move through that matrix. There's, an, there's additional constraints such as how the soil is, uh, is, is uh, who's next to the soil and stuff, but, but primarily it's derived from the soil texture. Secondarily, it's derived from... from some of the stuff that's, that's also inside the soil, maybe larger, larger pebbles and things like that. Sand has high permeability. We pour water into a, if I had a, a little tube of sand or I'd pour water in the top, the water would really quickly pour out the bottom, right? It would, it would permeate through that matrix. Clay, in, other wor in contrast, if I, if I had the same lump of clay, tried to pour water in, it's not gonna flow through. It's gonna sort of stay on the surface of that clay. So clay has low permeability. Also related to that is this notion of drainage, which is key for our wetland uh, concerns. So drainage both, both measures the amount of water um, in, in an area, say in, in these wetland soils. More typically though, we use the term drainage as um, sort of in a more management type context where we think about the potential uses of this soil. How, how easily drained is this? soil is this chunk of land. Drainage is going to indicate the frequency and duration of inundation or wetness that um, is likely to occur on this site. Um, and so in this case, it's just like permeability, it's, it's for primarily dictated by texture, but in this case, it's both texture and the local water supply and the local hydrology. And then again, as with permeability, secondarily, some of the other stuff that's in the soil, some of the rocks or cobble or other, other matrices that are in there. We have, uh, generally speaking, we recognize seven drainage classes. You do not need to know all these classes. You should probably jot them down so, you, so you're smart and you know them. But, but the key thing for us in this class are these two. Wetlands are going to occur primarily in very poorly drained, or what are called poorly drained soils. So in other words, the drainage is crappy. One of the ways people that don't like wetlands use to get rid of wetlands is to boost the drainage of the area and the water is not retained and we lose the hydrology, then we start losing, losing the functioning of that wetland. And therefore, for people that don't want the wetland there, it makes it less wetland-like and they can, you know, say, put their house there or, or fill it in or whatever they want to do. Why? Oh, he's asking me again. Why is it what? Well, um, wetlands are considered as a storm buffer, right? Mm -hmm. And if it, if the soil on wetland drains has a low permeability, why is it considered? Ah, I see. Okay, so the question was about about storm buffering, and so 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 if if wetlands say um, uh, don't drain well, why is that a good storm buffer? And the idea is that, um, generally speaking, it will it'll act as a reservoir. Well, there's various ways, and it's going to depend on the wetland, depend on the setting. But the answer to the question is, basically, um, wetlands have the capacity to take up water. So wetlands aren't necessarily consuming the water, if you will, in the water budget. They're rather acting as a temporal reservoir. So, rather, so you can imagine, um, let's say, an example of a... Uh, 
big storm surge out in front of a hurricane, uh, in front of a hurricane storm, from a big storm. If there weren't wetlands there, we would imagine the water would come up, it would go to the beach, and then it would go right up the beach into the forest, or right up the beach into the city. With a wetland in between, even though the wetland itself might have poorly drained soils, it's going to have all this structure. It's going to have plants. It's going to have depressions. It's going to have all this other stuff. So, so it'll act to, say, dissipate the energy of the wave, or it could actually act to retain a certain proportion of that water, not forever, maybe for a minute, maybe for an hour, maybe for a couple days. It's going to depend on the scenario, but it's going to act as a, a temporal sponge for the force or the energy of the material. Cool? Is that good? Other questions? So wetlands, primarily poorly drained or very poorly drained soils, which most importantly are a fun, uh, it, that ability to drain is dictated by soil texture. Number next important concept, the amount of organic material of life derived compounds of carbon compounds in that soil. Um, when we break, if you guys are interested, I can walk you over to our lab and show you our muffle furnaces that we have so we can measure this very important point of soils. But the, the idea here is that we want to be able to measure how much of the soil is carbon, how much of the soil is organic material. And this, is, this is organic not in the I want to buy some vegetables sense. This is organic in the chemistry sense, meaning carbon. The, the most important building block of our uh, life molecules. So in concept, it's the ratio of burnable to unburnable. Uh, well, in, con in concept, it's the ratio of carbon to other stuff. In practice, what we do is we take a chunk of soil, dry it, get all the water out of it, weigh it, and then uh, put it into a muffle furnace, which is very hot, thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, and get it so hot that all the carbon ceases to become liquid carbon or solid carbon and instead becomes gaseous carbon dioxide and floats out the smokestack and adds to, the car adds to climate change. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and then we reweigh, then we take that soil out, then we reweigh that soil, not allowing the soil to cool down because we don't want it to reabsorb any water. So we have a measure of perfectly dry soil to start with, and then perfectly dry soil without its carbon. And the difference is going to tell us what proportion of that weight, of that mass, of that soil chunk was organic material. The greater percentage of carbon the more organic, we would say, the soil is. In practice, most of the soils that we tend to look at seem to, usually terrestrial soils, tend to fall between about 15 and 75 percent. Um, the extreme would be sphagnum moss, we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's peat, it's also known as peat. Um, that has really, really, really high, that, that, that's going to be the extreme end of the most organic uh, of our soil. Essentially, uh, that, that quote-unquote soil is basically just dead moss. Mm -hmm. Here, so again, we, 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 we started this little part of our conversation with the notion of organic soils and mineral soils. So here's, here's one way you can break this down. This is from Mitch and Gosling. Uh, and we have mineral soils on the bottom. On the top is organic soils. And then we have this sort of weird, mucky, in-between zone. And uh, we can, and, then, and so you basically can determine that by looking at how much organic stuff is in the soil, how much dead matter is in there, and how many fines, how, how many fine-grained soil particles you have. And uh, yeah, I'll say that. Next concept is the concept of, I think some of you guys use the term layering. And so this notion of soil horizons. What do I mean by soil horizon? <clears throat> I mean a layer of soil that's discrete, and we can, we can perceive it to be discrete, uh, parallel to the surface of the ground, the surface of the soil. And we can tell this is different 
a variety of ways. We could use chemical tests. We could visually look at it. We could feel it with our hands. There's different ways. But this notion that we have different layers of our soil. Here's a classic one here. The O horizon is, well, I think I'll talk about it in a second. So, okay, so here we go. So here is, for example, we've gone into a wetland and uh, taken, I've taken a shovel and I've cut into the, the wetland here. And obviously there's the plants are at the top. And we have all, all of the surface of the soil and the plants are there. And you can, you can see a little bit here, there's some, some rhizomes or some roots that are going into the soil. But they go, generally speaking, a certain depth. And it might be hard to see in the back, but, but basically all those, that root activity is all in this zone. And if you look, even from back though, you guys can see there's this color chunk, right? Then there's this slightly darker, uh, slightly blacker, grayer, darker gray layer. And then beneath that, we have another layer. And check out this other layer. This has got a lot of iron in it. You can see this rust-like dots, right? That rust dot is down here. It's a little teeny bit of that up here, but not very much. But it's really, really common down here, and there's none of it up here, mm -hmm. right? So knowing nothing else, we can say, hey, there's sort of like a, like a birthday cake effect going on. There's a, there's a layer cake going on. And so there's something distinct probably about this, something distinct about this, and distinct about this. And, uh, and it depends on the soil and, the, and it depends on the setting as to how readily distinguishable those, those areas are. But the point is, there's layers. Yeah, Jamie. Is um, the oak horizon including the grassroots? Yes. Or right below? It, it's okay. just surface down. Surface down. So uh, this gets us next. And so this is great when it works like this. It doesn't always work like this, right? Things aren't, this is my nice little professor example, but things aren't always this clear. There's this notion of superposition. Let's start with soil that we've not messed with, that, that we haven't uh, done anything funky to. What we're going to get is we're going to get a series of layers or strata, as the geologists would say, with the oldest stuff deepest into the, towards the center of the earth, the most recently brought in or eroded material on the surface. So for example, in this, in this case, A is the oldest and is the lowest, then next would come B and then C, and then D was the, would be the youngest material. Everybody with me on that? Cool. So that's, we're going to start out with that. Then we start to get the real world, which is changes and deformities. So here we have this deposition event. We have sediment eroding down, running downhill, and layering up. So we, we go from A to B to C to D. Then we have something like an earthquake, tectonic activity, whatever. Could be, could be something like gophers. Could be something like uh, human activity. So one of the reasons archaeologists uh, and they'll say this isn't true, but I know this is true because I've worked with many of them, don't like animals. Why? Because gophers and things totally churn up their soil. Archaeologists love this kind of thing, right? Because it's really clear. It's really easy to see, right? Archaeologists like to see this thing on the right, right? Because then they go, ah, this bone was in here. This was a recently deposited bone. If it's down here, ooh, this, was, this is a much older bone, right? When we start getting these types of situations, it starts to become harder. But this is the real world. So maybe we, we first have a deposition event, then we have maybe the soil tilts a little bit. And then we start to get, and then it takes a long, then it's there for a while, and then the wind starts to go, or the rain starts to go, or whatever, and we start to get some erosion. And then we have more sediment. And now it's starting to get more complex, right? Now the thing isn't just a nice, pretty birthday layer cake. It's starting to get uh, different thicknesses. It depends on where we dig, all that jazz. So in the real world, these layers of soil, or these strata of soil or material, um, can, it typically looks like this. So we're looking at a cross section of a chunk of, of the earth. And um, in this case, we could get, uh, and this could have str strong implications for us in our wetland world. We can get a situation like this, which would be called a syncline. A syncline is where we have the youngest stuff at the middle 
of this, right? So here purple is youngest. So this could be the, the youngest stuff. Older, older, oldest. The opposite is called an anticline and is the same exact thing. It's just it folded in a different direction. So check it out. If this, let's say this material, let's say the, the, the purple material has high permeability. Let's say the, the chocolate uh, granity looking stuff has, because it's like high permeability. And then this white stuff has very low permeability, right? Hard for water to go through. If we had this situation on the left, a syncline, we could get maybe a kick butt wetland pretty easily. Why? Because when the water rains down or flows in when the river goes over its bank or whatever the deal is, it's going to essentially capture that in a pocket. And it's going to act to retain that water longer than it otherwise would be there. Versus if we have an anticline, generally that's not good for wetlands. Because the, let's assume the same exact properties we just talked about. Now look, that water is going to start to percolate through the ground, and then it's going to boom, hit that and just go off. Right? So synclines tend to be good for wetlands. Anticlines tend to be good for oil and gas people. Because it's doing the same thing, but in that case, it's capturing uh, hydrocarbons down deep. All good? So we like synclines, generally speaking. Um, right. Okay, cool. And then this is what you and I ultimately see. So this is, this is the final product for when you and I are, are, are starting to look at our wetlands. This is a soils map of coastal Ventura County. So here is Magoo Lagoon. Here is farther up towards Port Wainimi and Channel Islands Harbor. When we look down at the surface of the earth, which is where our wetlands are starting, right? We see patterns like this. It's very, you know, squigglies, um, um, different blurbs, different polygons, different murmur of a certain soil type, right? That's because what we're seeing here is the topmost version of some of these different synclines, anticlines, erosion, depositional events, all these different things. So it's going to amount to um, what sometimes looks like chaos, but really once you understand what's going on, you can learn some stuff and, 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 and understand that, hey, this site might be relatively good for wetlands. This site might be relatively bad. So if we're trying to do a restoration, the, one of the first things you want to do is, is have a look at what the soils are like. What's, what's the substrate going to be like before we begin? OK, next concept, the notion of soil color, a really, a really helpful thing for us. This is something we don't need any expensive uh, high-tech uh, gadgetry. We can just simply go out and look with our eyeballs. We're going to look at the color of a given soil profile, or, or, or when we cut into the soil, look at, see, look at what the color is. What you're seeing here is a so-called uh, soil chart. You can buy these uh, charts, and these are you know, very precisely printed and, and, and machined so that they're a very clear color. And you would essentially pick up some soil, for example, and then you just move your bag of soil up and down along the colors until you find the right color. And then that color will tell you something, not, not everything, but it'll give you some initial guesses as to what's going on. In general, we would talk about the overall color of this soil. The overall, you know, the default, the majority color would be the soil matrix color. And then if there are little, little, um, uh, discolorations or little pockets of color, we call those models. And so that would be like in that last slide I showed you the orange stains in the, in the background of smooth gray, for example. The color, well, related to wetlands, it's a much more complex, complex subject for just talking about soils, but in the context of wetlands, we're really talking about iron and manganese. Those are two substances that are going to rust. Those are two substances that are going to readily oxidize. And they will change color when they do that. So a clear signal to us that this soil has been in the presence of, uh, of, uh, of an oxidizing environment or, or hasn't been. And then also the amount of organic material. The amount of organic material is going to make it more black chocolate brown color on average. The less organic matter, the more grayer, the lighter colored the soil will look. 
So there's all kinds of complex things. Don't need to worry about the complex things. You need to basically remember that there's there's uh, darkness is generally correlated with organic material, and then rustiness corresponds to an oxidizing environment for metals, especially iron. So here's some of the oops. So here's some of the colors we tend to see. Um, when you see a lot of whites, that tends to be salts and carbonates. Grays tend to indicate a relatively high water table and frequently saturated and uh, generally redu a reducing situation. More on that in a second. Uh, black tends to be really highly organic soils, like black, black muck. Like you put your boot in the water and you pull your boot out and it's, and it's just totally black. Or if you had a white sock, as sometimes happened, and people's, people's feet come out of their boots and they touch the super black soil, it's never going to be white again, no matter how much bleach <laughs> you use, right? So that would, be, um, that would be a highly organic content. A lot of that black is also really, really, um, uh, well, it's, it's, it's uh, iron sulfides and manganese oxides. And then we get all these oranges and yellows, and that comes from the rust of, of the uh, metals, like especially iron. Okay, a couple more things here. Again, don't get lost in the chemistry. This is, this is a theory class here, but we need to touch on it. So oxidation state is a strong measure as, as to what's going on chemically with this soil. What, what, what's the chemical activity in this chunk of soil? If there's a lot of oxygen in the soil, it's aerobic. If there's no oxygen in the soil, it's anaerobic, if you remember those terms from, from before. Um, technically, redox potential is the so-called electron pressure. We usually measure it in uh, millivolts. Um, and, and, it, and it represents the, the tendency of that, uh, in this case, soil, to reduce or to oxidize. So to add on an oxygen or remove a hydrogen. pH is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity. And this really, all, so the, these, chemi these chemistry things are all related to one another, generally speaking, in, in this wetland context. So one doesn't vary in isolation, but, but these things go up in, in tandem. So, um, so pH will influence redox state. And uh, when we tend to have a lot of water impounded on an area, that tends to make it more carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide rich, and that tends to make it more acidic by making carbonic acid. So lots of standing water, not a lot of movement, more acidic. Another important one for us, especially here in the coastal zone, is salinity. How much salt is in the water or how much salt is in the soil? So salinity here refers to the concentration of inorganic dissolved salts in the water. The units we typically use are parts per thousand. You can just abbreviate it PPT. There's a symbol for that, which is very similar to our percentage symbol, but it has an extra zero. The percent symbol was invented by the clerks, or what the Brits call the clerks, the Clarks, back in the big trading days of the British Empire, when they got tired of writing down, you know, divided by 100 all the time. So they wrote 0 slash 0 to mean 100. They essentially dropped a 10. So for the, the proportion out of 1,000 instead of 100, by analogy, you write two zeros instead of just one. So you can either choose to write the, the parts per 1,000 symbol, or you can just write PPT when you're referring to uh, salinity. Typical seawater is about 34, 35, 36 parts per thousand. Um, and right, just to, for complete, just so everybody's on the same page, if we express it as percent salt, we'd say 3.5 percent. But we don't usually do that. We usually talk about parts per thousand, and so it becomes 35, and that's by just tradition and convention. So we will talk about salinity usually on a scale. So fresh water, purely fresh water, would have a salinity of zero. Regular seawater out here to have a salinity of about 35. In our, air, oh, look, I wrote it right, right here. Look, geez, I um, should look at my slide. So <laughs> distilled water is zero. 
Cayugas Creek right now, right out here, is somewhere around probably four or five parts per thousand. So it's fresh water, but it's not pure, pure uh, deionized water, for example. Some of our far salt pans in those areas we're looking at late summer when a lot of evaporation is happening, little fresh water, little rains or anything is, is coming in. That salinity is, that we measure is typically um, twice salt water, so, so twice as salty. And, and the, the saltiest body of consistent body of water we have on the earth is the Dead Sea. And that's a salinity of 240 parts per thousand. That's super salty. So if you want to write a murder mystery, say the guy drowned in the Dead Sea because it's almost impossible to drown there. It's, you're so buoyant. It's, it's so salty. Um, in practice, we measure salinity by electrical conductance. We can also use refraction of light with a thing called um, a refractometer or using uh, a thermometer and a, and a specific gravity um, uh, tool. But typically, these days, most everybody uses uh, electrical conductance. Almost done with our soils here. Uh, nutrients, another important part. Because we're talking about wetland restoration in this class, we most typically use the so-called limiting nutrient approach. That idea comes from farmers in the 1800s in, in Britain. And that idea is, hey, why can't my plants grow? Well, I'll give them a little bit of this. Nope. Sorry. Not the call I was waiting for. Um, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. So, um, so we're talking about limiting nutrients here. So the idea is I add something. Does that make a lot of plants grow? No. Okay. Let me add a different substance. Does that make a lot of plants grow? Mm, no. Let me add nitrogen. Oh my God, the plants grow a lot. And so that notion grew up of what was the limiting quote unquote nutrient. It's kind of a silly concept because once we, once we add that nitrogen and we give it enough nitrogen, now something else will become limiting. But when you go through that process, what you find pretty consistently for our terrestrial, system, our terrestrial plant systems, um, uh, they, they need carbon, right? So usually in the form of atmospheric carbon, but they need carbon, um, uh, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Excuse me, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those are the basic structural blocks. And then we have these nutrients. The next most common things, next most important things are these nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sil silicon, excuse me. Um, mostly what we're talking about in the context of restoration, we're mostly talking about two main things. That would be nitrogen and or phosphorus. Nitrogen um, we get from taking atmospheric nitrogen, which is the vast majority of well, I just sucked into my lungs right now, right? Most of our atmosphere is nitrogen, but it's, it's, it's non-biologically available. It's inert form of nitrogen. We need microbes to take that nitrogen, crack it, break it, do some chemistry to it, and make, put it into a form that we can use. And so um, that process is called nitrification. And most typically, we take P and we turn that into ammonium. And then we have different uh, common uh, uh, families, actually, that are shown as a genus here, but they're actually uh, lot, lots of uh, critters can do this, uh, convert this ammonium into nitrite and then ultimately into nitrate. And nitrate is the fertilizer. Nitrate's the main thing that plants, that's biolog readily uptakeable, readily usable by plants. Uh, then the other thing would be phosphorus. So phosphorus, so those two things, nitrogen and phosphorus, if our plants aren't growing well in our, and we got everything else right, we got the hydrology right, we got the grain size right, we might say, hey, do we have enough nutrients in here? Can the plants grow at an acceptable rate? Again, we take all that together and we can, we, now you guys are starting to see this mineral versus organic soil um, uh, breakdowns. So this, this stuff should start to make a little more sense now, right? So when we talk about mineral soils, again, uh, relatively less organic, rel uh, holds little water, neutral pH, nutrients uh, are readily available if they're there, but, but they go away really quick. Organic soils, organic stuff is very greedy. <laughs> organic holds on to stuff, holds on to water, holds on to nutrients, right? Holds on to all this stuff. So from the perspective of plants, that's usually better. 
because we don't want everything all in one five minute period when it rains, right? We like it sort of dribbled out over the course of days and weeks and months. So, so organic soils are better for plants, for most plants to grow, especially our wetland plants. All this stuff together, all the things we've just been talking about, when we, when we expose our soil to water, it's going to make that soil so-called hydric, right? Exposed to water. So hydric soils are created when we have water um, abundantly in contact with those soil particles. The classic case would be we had an area, there wasn't anything, and then we, and, or wasn't exposed to water, and then we flooded it with water. And that water ponded, and yeah, okay, uh, excuse me. So, uh, so, so let's start over again. I'm going to redo this. Okay, sorry. So starting over. Uh, so hydric soils here are created from all of this, the things we just talked about, water in the presence of water. So hydric soils are going to form when we have water exposed to our soil particles. The classic case, we have an area not exposed to water, it's in a depression, then we bring water in. Now this water is impounded and it's in you know, long contact with this soil. And it's a nice, good condition. It's not freezing cold winter, but it's, say, middle of the summer. And then we start to get these, th this um, soil becoming hydric, becoming exposed. And uh, we get uh, things like uh, reduced environments. And we start to get different behavior of the soil and... As I mentioned before, we have organic and mineral. Uh, the, the mineral stuff is primarily rock. The organic stuff is primarily life-derived stuff. We're going to first talk about peat soils or peats and then other stuff. So the other stuff besides peat are often referred to as histols, meaning soil, um, uh, water, waterlogged soil is histols. So we, we have histols and peat are the two gross categories of organic soils and then the stuff in the mineral is just mineral. This stuff is important because the different soils are going to, not entirely, there's many factors that, that lead to why we have the diversity of wetlands we do and why the particular type of wetlands we do in the particular place, but it starts with the soils. It's th the soils provide the context for the kind of wetlands that we can have there. Next would be the water. That would be the next most important thing. So a few different examples of some of the kind of wetlands that we have. I've broken them down into marshes, which are wetlands dominated by herbaceous plant vegetation, and swamps, which would be wetlands dominated by woody vegetation. Uh, and these are, these are but a small subset of the whole, you know, there's many, there's a gazillion names and a different... Uh, uh, billabongs and we can go for days listing all the different types of wetlands but these are just some some ones to give you a range we'll talk more about tidal salt marshes in a moment in a moment um, but fens bogs uh, different examples of wet meadows and then of course the swamps um, i'll just note that um, bottomland hardwood forests are the classic swamp the swamp that you're that you think of where the murder mystery happens and, and scooby-doo goes and hangs out that's a that's a you're generally speaking a bottomland hardwood forest a cypress forest Mangroves are wooded wetlands on the coast in the tropics. There's also another category which is referred to as shrub or sometimes scrub swamps. And that would be areas where um, it wants to be woody, but because the soils can't really support a lot of big trees, it's just stubby woody stuff, right? So small woody vegetation as opposed to big woody, as opposed to tall vegetation. Peat. What is peat? Peat is dead stuff. Peat is dead moss. Peat is partially decomposed plant material, primarily moss, that accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and accumulates over hundreds and thousands and thousands of years. So very slow buildup of these materials. Peat forms the community that we would refer to as peatlands, extensive areas that are one type of wetland, but um, extensive 
aggregations of moss. If we start digging into the peatlands beyond the topmost layer, they really ch tend to be chocolatey, brownish black. Peat is created from sphagnum moss. There's 300, when I last looked it up, there's something about 380 species of these guys, but they're all um, you know, closely related. These guys grow and they die. The plants that are growing in this matrix also grow and die, but primarily most of the material is this moss. Um, you can get woody things growing in sphagnum mosses too. Uh, you know, so technically you can get other stuff too, but it's, it doesn't happen all that often. Um, most of what you're walking on when you walk on a peat bog, has anybody been to a peat bog or peat land? Uh, uh, bogs are, can be comprised of peat, but, but by peat land, I'm talking about a really, really extensive area. Mm -hmm. So they're cool. You actually can jump and it's like being on a trampoline because, because literally, literally you're on mostly water. It's sort of like being on jello. So it, it you, I mean, you don't, you, your foot doesn't go deep or, or doesn't, you don't go deep. So you're, it looks from the outset, like you're walking on something, but really you're walking on a matrix of plants in a tub of water, basically. So 90% on average of what you see is water, and then you see a little bit of solid stuff. So when you jump up and down, it's like a big cushion. You know, it's like you can, it's hard to break your ankle. Well, I guess that's not true. It's, uh, I could probably break my ankle. But, it, but it's, you know I mean? It's, 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 it's hard to fall down and get hurt, right? It's soft. It's very forgiving. As soon as we go down uh, into that, it's super, uh, anaerobic, no, hardly. So it's all that water, but that water isn't moving, right? We have all this, all these plant thalli and all these stems and things that are that are not letting the water easily move. So it doesn't move very much. So whatever activities, physiological activities on there, is pretty much robbed the oxygen from the from the soil, and so it's really a black, dark, anoxic area, slow to decompose. Some of our oldest human fossils of non-royalty, just Joe Blow, which tend to be a lot more helpful to us than like what the Pharaoh was wearing, right? Because you get more of an insight as to what the common people were doing, what food they were eating. Peat bogs are fantastic sources of these mummified human remains because, the, the, because there's so little oxygen, things don't rot very quickly, right? It's like a long time to break down. Uh, here are some guys harvesting peat right now. So this is what it looks like. People have been, har we humans have been harvesting peat for a long, long time. So all of that is peat? Uh, so, uh, there, there, there's, there's grass and stuff here too. But, there, but, all, but this matrix is mostly peat that they're cutting out. And so, um, so we have harvested, especially in, in northern climates in places like Ireland and northern Europe and Canada and places like that we harvest this stuff. It's it's a fantastic resource. People burn it. You can just straight up burn it. You can use it for building. Yeah, it smells good. You can use it for building materials. We primarily cut it up to give to you in the form of soil at Home Depot. So when you go look at soil amendments, you'll see sphagnum or or peat, and you know it's it's a wonderful thing for planting your your orchids and stuff in. But the rate at which we're harvesting this thing, we are greatly outstripping the production as with many of our non so this is this is a renewable resource if you have a couple thousand years to wait for it to regenerate right but um but this is this is a challenge and and one of the one of the challenges we face is sometimes when we we go to culture some of our rare plants to do a restoration of a wetland in southern california you might go to buy some soil matrix and you're actually buying the remnants of another wetland that we cut up, right? <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll just mention that really quick, but, uh, but yeah. Okay, so for example, uh, here's a couple examples of different types of wetlands. We can talk about a fen. Fens are generally glacial in origin. Uh, this would be areas that are fed primarily with subsurface flow, not so much rivers and stuff, but, but glacial melt, um, subsurface melt. Um, we would refer to these as um, uh, minerotrophic waters, meaning that usually a lot of calcium and other ions, and they tend to be slightly alkaline. 
Um, peat are usually on the order of a couple meters deep in these wetlands. And these are similar to our wet meadows that we have in other uh, more climates familiar to us. Um, but our wet meadows don't have uh, some of these aspects. So fen is, is, a, is a glacial wetland next to that. Bog would be, you guys asked about bogs a minute ago. Bog would be something um, that does have peat. And this peat tends to be a bit deeper, a more substantial peat matrix. Um, on the order of anywhere from a couple meters to maybe tens of meters. Again, I mentioned already that we have a slow decomposition rate. This bogs tend to be in cool areas. We don't get bogs in hot places like Southern California because the evapotranspiration is too great. And so you don't ever get them started really. So this is more Pacific Northwest. This is more cool forest, uh, those types of uh, areas. Uh, I already mentioned that a lot of, a lot of the, a large amount of the material um, is water that's underneath your feet. And there's a couple different layers here. The key part is the top layer, the uppermost layer, usually less than half a meter, is the green stuff, is the actively living moss, is the actively dividing moss, the doing its due. As soon as you go through that, those top tens of centimeters, you get into the black stuff, the dead, the rotting, the decaying stuff. And uh, these tend to be in mineral poor uh, areas. Very important wetland type for us here in California, uh, vernal pools. These are seasonal wetlands. These are wetlands that um, really only become wet for a relatively small window of the year. These are usually depauperate soils, usually old soils, usually with some kind of really impermeable layer underneath, oftentimes in a bowl-shaped uh, area. So this background picture is a classic example of a California vernal pool where we're in a grassy meadow. And if we looked at it during a lot of the year, it would just look like grass. And we're saying, whatever, it's, it's grass, dude, no big deal. But during when, in certain times of the year when we get rain, we get water pooling up. And then that activates this incredible rapid life history cycle. Um, the classic species would be things like fairy shrimp, little brine-like shrimp that that live their life very quickly, mate, lay eggs. The eggs insist or a resistive stage, a stage that can stand being dried in the air. The water goes away, the, the eggs hang out, and they just wait for the next rain. The rains come, they make the eggs pop open, the little babies, the little, little, little eggs turn into larvae, the little larvae turn into adults, and they, they repeat the whole cycle over again. Um, the yellow guys you're seeing here, these are uh, brass buttons. This, they're, they're classic wildflowers are in and around these vernal pools, um, typically again around some type of usually a clay rich or hard pan soil subsurface. Um, yeah, right. So these are these are usually in, in um, we see a lot of these in coastal areas, we see a lot of these inland, a lot of our inland ones have been destroyed in the Central Valley by farms and stuff, but these are really important habitats. Uh, another example of the types of wetlands we see are bottomland hardwood forests. More about that when we do um, when we talk about our New Orleans work. And if you guys are interested, you guys can come with us this spring to Louisiana if you guys want to see some of our wetlands and some of the stuff we've been working on restoring. Uh, these are oftentimes so or are they always? I guess they're always. There's probably some examples where they aren't, but all the ones I can think of are alluvial systems meaning of or associated with moving water so river deposited moving water deposited sediments and influence soils um, typically on a seasonal flooding event so so during the spring floods the area gets super wet and it stays wet most of the spring on into the summer and then it starts to dry out uh, these soils tend to be really high in organic matter really acidic and um, usually a lot of finds a lot of clays and this example here we're looking at Cy uh, cypress swamp in the background here okay lastly we'll finish up by talking about tidal salt marsh is that cool is that, this is going pretty fast was this making sense everybody okay good okay two things about tidal salt marshes geomorphology and gradients we're almost done here so again here's here's an example of our tidal marsh in the context of what we've been talking about so far today 
we would really talk about our salt marsh to a great extent, like a lot of our wetlands, like our peat, our peat areas, are really developing their own soil, right? So obviously some of this soil matrix is coming in, eroding in from outside, but a lot of it is the biogenic material, the plant material that we've grown on our site that has gotten big, gotten tall, gotten old, died, and then that dead material is now being converted into this soil matrix. So the soil is, in the case of salt marshes, is a mix of mud and plant tissues. Um, yeah, I'll say that. We've seen this before, but just to remind us that the types of salt marshes, tidal salt marshes we have here on the West Coast are different from just about everywhere else in the U.S. We have these very up-down coasts, these geomorphic, geologically young coasts. So we have much more up and down steep coasts, whereas the East Coast, the Gulf Coast has much flatter. They have much more expansive salt marshes. Our salt marshes tend to be small, tend to be isolated relative to elsewhere. Let's talk a little bit about the shape of uh, salt marshes and, and the physical orientation. So here we go. So this is, uh, this is um, you know, again, a classic salt marsh where we have the uh, tidal creek bringing water in. Could be more fresh, could be more salt, depend on, depends on the, the tidal cycle, et cetera. But this would be a classic uh, salt marsh. Key to this, key to at least healthy salt marshes, are these tidal creeks. Um, these tidal creeks, we increasingly realize, are very important for driving diversity of the organisms in the site. Diversity of the plants, diversity of the animals. So what I'm showing you here is a cartoon of, the, of, a, of a tidal creek. The nomenclature that we use is borrowed from regular streams and rivers on the mainland. So we have um, a first order channel, so-called second order channel, third order channel, etc. Same idea. So in this case, how we're articulating, so this would be, say, the dry part of the, or the, the vegetated part of the marsh, maybe down here is towards the mouth. All this fine branching, we would say, how many, we'd number this creek, the geomorphology, the shape of the describing this by saying, is this a first order uh, tidal creek or tidal channel? If nothing else dumps into it, it's a first order. If it's dumped into by another creek, it's second order, right? And then, then if a second order creek dumps into it, it's a third order and, and et cetera. Does that make sense? That's right. That's right. Yes. So for the tidal creeks, we, we, we describe them reverse from how we typically think of streams coming from the mountain going to the ocean. So here's a shot that I took in Morro Bay. And you can see that here, right? We have, so here's these little teeny, in fact, some of these, a lot of these channels you can't quite fully see because the very, very ends of them are, are covered in vegetation. So if we were to somehow do a, I don't know, a giant wildfire and burn all this stuff off, we would probably see that this channel right here, you know, probably continues a little bit more, another, you know, 20 feet or something, 30 feet. But basically, little, 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 oh, join this one bigger, and then, oh, join this one bigger, and then, oh, join this one bigger, and you keep, boom, and then bigger, and, and, and so forth, right? So this geomorphology is really clear. When we first started doing restorations in salt marshes years ago, we didn't understand this. We didn't really put in tidal channels. We just assumed they would come. Or we tried a very rudimentary, very simple, just dig a little ditch. We now know that if we really want to jumpstart the process, we should excavate, not every single little teeny small one, but you know, excavate more of this channel morphology. It'll really help the functioning get up to speed much better. This area I'm showing you here in Morro Bay is one of the least disturbed wetlands in this segment of California. That's why we can still see the complex curviness of the tidal channels. Again, same idea. In this case, now we're up in China Camp, up in San Francisco Bay, and I'm taking this from this picture from a little bit of a hill, but same idea. Now you can't perhaps from this angle see the creeks, but you can see the vegetation. And so this vegetation is tracking with the creeks. So this darker colored vegetation in this sea of Salicornia is, is um, you know, demarcating these, these articulated branching streams. So tidal salt marshes, 
have a lot of stream articulation, a lot of sinuosity, a lot of um, important geomorphology. Um, more on this when we talk about the biology, but I'll just simply say that, that um, we can get this geomorphology starting from disturbances. In this case, this was some, this was the plants died and then created a salt pan, and this salt pan is going to eventually turn into a tidal creek. And that was a salt pan. The next phase, the salt pan is starting to recover. So now we have, in this case, this is a lot of batis meridima, uh, which we'll learn about in a little bit. But, um, but uh, 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 early colonizing plant has come on in and filled in that, that salt pan. So now it's vegetated. And oftentimes, well, yeah, I'll just say that. So, so, so we get this successional phase, just like you guys were reading about in your most recent chapter. Succession doesn't just happen in a forest. It happens everywhere, and it's happening here in our salt marshes. Um, the initial uh, impetus here is smothering, typically. What's going to start this is smothering. So this was originally a bunch of contiguous plants. The plants died. They could die because of marine debris or garbage that we released, say a big, a big plank or a big uh, piece of plywood, or it could come from biological material. In this case, that's what we see here. A bunch of, bunch of um, plant stems have come down and smothered stuff. And if I, we lift it off, as I just have, I just lifted this off, and what you see inside here are a bunch of seeds starting to germinate. Um, we have zonate. So one important geomorphology, geomorphological aspect or, or landscape element of our tidal salt marshes is this tidal creek phenomenon. Empty areas, tidal areas, vegetated areas. We also have strong gradients, typically. Strong salinity gradients, other things. And that tends to produce zonation. Horizontal, vertical zonation. And that's what we're seeing here. This is all the same genus, but this is Spartina alterniflora. This is Spartina patens, or patens. I hear people say it both ways. This is, this is an East Coast example. This is from, um, this is from up in, the, in New England. But, um, but right, we can see there's, there's different plants growing in different eras, regions. Okay, we'll stop there.